but I forgot my water. Can't believe that. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Let's just begin with, uh, we, we looked at two lessons this week, and I hope that they were a blessing to you. And uh, the first one was the Holy Spirit, and the second one was about Satan and temptation, right? Okay, so we begin to go over this a little bit. And uh, thank you, Don. That's awful kind of you. Marcia. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Okay, question one. What do we mean that the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force? Who is the Holy Spirit? Who'd like to be first to help us here? Anybody? I'll tell you what, I'll give you a couple answers first, get us going. And then I have a question, my own question for you as we go through this, okay? Uh, he's the third person of the Godhead. Uh, he's equally God. He's deity, right? And we also learn that he has intellect, will, emotion. He speaks. He has personality, okay? So he's a, he's a person, and that's important for us to remember that. Uh, now, how should that affect us? The fact that he is a person, how should that affect us as a child of God? Anybody here say besides me? Anybody? <laughs> huh? What do you think? Yes, Kay. Okay, that's true. But how does it affect your life, Richard? Amen. Yes, sir. Coop. He'll check you, won't you? Okay. So it affects us in different ways. What you're saying is uh, it affects the way we live, right? Okay. Melba? Right. Good point. It's not an it. However, there is one place in the scripture that says it, referring to him. It's interesting, okay? But that's God saying that. That's not us saying that, okay? And, uh, but uh, uh, he is a, he's a person and he needs to be dressed that way. Uh, you, t you talk to a person, don't you? Huh? Uh, it's not some force like the Jehovah's Witness say. Uh, it's an individual person. Uh, Bev, saw your hand? Helps us pray. We're going to get to that. Okay, that's part of our lesson. Okay. Okay, question number two. How does the Holy Spirit work regarding our salvation? I wrote this down. He works through God's Word to penetrate the sinner's heart. That's pretty hard sometimes, isn't it? Huh? And to bring conviction of sin. He shows us Christ, the gospel, as the answer. And then the moment we believe the gospel, the Spirit rebirths us, giving us spiritual life. Okay? So that's how he works in our life to bring us to faith in the gospel. Uh, Titus 3.5 says this here. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Uh, remember when Adam sinned, the Spirit of God left Adam. He was spiritually dead. So it's a reintroduction to the Spirit of God into the life of an individual person when you get saved. Ephesians 2.1 tells us this here, And you hath he, the Spirit, quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Quickened means made alive. He resurrected us up spiritually, hasn't he? Okay? And that's the work of the Spirit of God. I also put some other verses down I thought were good. John 6, says, No man can come to, the, to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. How does a father draw an individual person to the Lord? Well, he does that through the Spirit of God working on him, doesn't he? Huh? Of convicting him, convincing him of truth, pulling him, right? Drawing him. And if the Spirit of God doesn't do that, man would never go to God. He just wouldn't do it. Uh, John 6, 29 is a great verse. says this here. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him. You see, he works that we might believe. Okay? He brings us to that faith. And then, of course, a great verse for the Holy Spirit, John 16, 7. 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And so that's the Spirit's working, isn't it? He's convincing us of our sin. He points us to the one who is righteous. God demands righteousness, and you can only find that in one person, can't you? The Lord, uh, God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Right? And so that's the Holy Spirit's working in our life. Okay? Number three, how is the Holy Spirit instrumental concerning the body of Christ? Uh, what's he doing? Well, upon salvation, he places us in Christ's spiritual body. Then us being in Christ, that makes us to be in position. That last part, why does that affect us? It makes, it places us in a position of security, safety, eternal life. It makes us in a position of being accepted by God. Whereas before we were alienated from the life of God, right? Uh, we had no life. We had no relationship. We had no covenants with God whatsoever. But now I'm accepted in the beloved. And by the way, that's the only way you'll ever be accepted, isn't it? Ephesians 1, 6 says this, To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted. How? In the beloved. Okay? So, how does, that, how does that work? How do I get in Christ? How do I get in Christ? Believe the gospel and something happens. What is it? Baptism. Water? No. Spiritual baptism. Okay? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all who put our faith in the gospel. We all uh, are we all baptized into one body. Okay? So we're immersed, we're placed into, we're fused into Christ that it causes us to be identified with Christ now. His death becomes mine. His resurrection becomes mine. I'm identified with Christ now. I'm in him. Remember, we were in Adam. Sinners, lost. Spirit of God takes us out of the position of being in Adam, spiritually places us into the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. Now we're in Christ. Okay? And the Spirit of God is the one who does that. Okay? Uh, Galatians 3.26 says this, for you are the children of God, how? By faith. Now, when it says that, that means in the Christ, his finished work, who he is and what he's accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection, right? The next verse, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, that's not water. Water can't not place you into Christ, okay? Only the Spirit of God can. So, we're baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ, have put on Christ. You see that? And then another good verse I like, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised, now get this, with the circumcision made without hands. What, what does that mean? That means it's a spiritual circumcision. It's not physical, a literal one, but it's done through the Spirit of God in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then he says the next verse, buried with him in baptism, not water, spirit, in, in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. You see, it's an operation of God means it's a spiritual baptism. You see that? Okay. That makes sense to you? Okay. Now, what do most people today in Christendom say have you ever been baptized by the Spirit of God? What do they say? 
Huh? Somebody help me here. Ken, uh, who? When you say, have you been baptized by the Spirit? What does most of Christendom say? Speak in tongues. Second experience. Second work of grace. Right? That's what most of them say. Right? But, but baptism of the Spirit according to the Scripture, not what our church denomination or tradition says, but the Bible is the baptism of the Spirit is the Spirit of God taking you out of Adam and, and placing you into Jesus Christ where you identify with as one of His now. Okay? Okay, number four. What does His indwelling mean to you? Okay? What does that mean to you? Okay? God the Holy Spirit, He lives in me now. He indwells me now. What, what does that do for you? Yes. Amen. Uh, and that's all that's great. God lives in us. Thus, he works inside of our inner man, giving us his anointing. Am I anointed? Since I have the Spirit of God, yes, I am. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.21 says this, Now he would establish us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Okay? 1 John 2, 20 says this here, but you have an unction from the Holy One, talking about the Spirit of God, and you know all things. And so because of His presence now, it affects us, okay? Uh, it makes me accountable now. Why? Yes, Linda? Yes. Well, He indwells in us in our bodies, right? Yes. But uh, what does, let me, what I want to say. By his presence in me, it makes me accountable. How does it make me accountable? I'm not living for myself, true. Everywhere I go, he knows who I am. He knows what I do. <laughs> Amen? Huh? So as a result of that, it affects me to be more accountable. And, you know, if I'm in sin, he's right there with me. And so that should back me off. Amen? And so it makes me more accountable. And uh, also, because of his indwelling me, now he helps me to be able to understand the Word of God, doesn't he? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what a man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. And now he lives inside of us. And he's there to help us to be able to understand. Amen? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways it should affect us that wherever I go, God goes with me because he's in me. Okay? Uh, number five. What is the seal and why is it so important? Okay? What is the seal and why is it so important? the sealing of the Spirit of God. Huh? huh? Assurance? Okay. I put this down. His seal guarantees our final delivery to glory because it's God himself who promises us this. His seal also signifies his ownership of those he's forgiven and saved. His seal identifies us. We belong to him. Amen? 
And so just some great things. Now, can that seal be broken? Why not? Okay, hand. Give me, let me see a hand there. Huh? It's all of him. Okay, that's true. Nobody has answered what the seal is. The seal is the Holy Spirit himself. What's going to break that? Huh? All right. So what does that mean? Once saved, always saved, eternal security. Okay, that's what that means. 1 Peter 1.5 says this here. Just the first part of it. We are kept, how? By the power of God through faith and the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen? How long is he sealed? How long is that seal in our life? Ephesians 4.30, the last part of that verse, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed for how long? Unto the day of redemption. Now, when is the day of redemption? Huh? It's right here when you go up in the rapture, when you meet Christ in the air, and you, and you go to heaven with him. Amen? So that, that's my guarantee. It's God's promise and hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised. And it's the Holy Spirit's power that makes sure that we have that. Okay? Uh, number six, explain earnest and how that relates to believers. Explain earnest and how that relates to believers. Yes. Amen. 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 Uh, it's the down payment, right, of with the rest to come, okay? Uh, you put a down payment on a house, and you're promising them the rest will be coming. Amen? Now, remember, when you get saved, there are three stages of salvation. Even though already in the mind, the purpose, plan of God, it's a completed deal, we have been saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. I have been saved, justified. I am being saved, sanctified. I will be saved, glorified. Okay? Make sense? Okay? But in the mind of God, we're completed, done, deal. And when God's purpose and plan begins, you know what always happens? It finishes, amen. It sure does, okay? So the Spirit is the down payment, guaranteeing full payment. The rest will come. Knowing this again gives the believer safe security till Jesus comes for us. This is a one-time action resulting in permanent fulfillment. It started, but it's already guaranteed to be fulfilled. Amen? And uh, so that's what earnest means. It's just the down payment. The Spirit of God is the down payment, and God promises we will receive total salvation one day when we're glorified. Okay? Uh, and the biggest thing, by the way, we're waiting for is what? The redemption of our body. Okay? Okay? Uh, that has not been re redeemed yet as such, but one day it will be, okay? That's why we have aches and pains right now. Yeah. Uh, so the Spirit is God's pledge that our total salvation will be finished. Hebrews 12, 2 is a good verse for this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand. Notice he's the author. That means the originator, the beginner of our faith. But also he's the completer, the finalizer, the finisher of our faith. 
Okay? What he starts, uh, he which hath begun a good work in you, hath begun it, a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Somebody will just go, woo, just a little bit every now and then. <laughs> Nothing wrong with getting excited about some truth. Bunch of deadheads. You're from the 60s, aren't you? Huh? Okay, number seven. Just kidding. Yeah. Explain enlightenment and how that assists the believer. Okay? How does that assist the believer? Enlightenment. Melba. Turns the light on. Turns the light on. Light comes on, the Holy Spirit gives us understanding of the Word of God, all right? Have you ever been studying the Bible, by the way? And, uh, you know, you're, you've read a, a verse a thousand times, and then one day you come down and you see it within its context, and the light comes on. Uh, what is it? That's illumination of the Spirit of God, okay? Just like rightly dividing. Why haven't we seen that years ago? Isn't that amazing? But the lights are coming on to more and more people. And boy, we praise God for that. We really do. Uh, the Spirit opens our eyes, our mind, to give us light and understandings of the Scriptures. Under scripture, understanding Scripture helps us then to believe and obey the truth. Okay? Knowing God's truth also helps us to be more stable, anchored, so we won't be fooled by false doctrine. Amen? It's vital that the Spirit of God works in us so that we not be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And there's all kinds of winds of doctrine out there today, isn't there? And I mean, there's some crazy stuff out there. Huh? You ever watch TV? You ever get sick, have to stay in for a week and watch TV and watch the Christian channel? It's mind-boggling. Absolutely mind-boggling. And uh, number eight, why is the Spirit's power necessary in the believer's life and how do we engage that power? But why is the Spirit's power necessary in the believer's life? Why is it necessary? Yes, ma'am. Through His power. So it enables us what? It enables us to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay? So what it does, we need His power to walk worthy of the position. We're in Christ now. We're a child of the King. We need to walk worthy of that title. Amen? Christian, by the way, what does Christian mean? Christ ones, okay? And that's what we are to imitate, that the life of Christ might be manifest in our bodies, okay? Now, how do we engage this power? By faith. We just accept God's power within us by faith that it's true, and then we step out in obedience. And the amazing thing is, as we step out in obedience and faith, we begin to experience that power working in us. Given an example of how the Spirit of God, the power of God, helped you in a situation. Give me an example, somebody. Yes. As I go to Good News Mission to preach every so often, I've prepared it, I had it over and over, but I just didn't feel comfortable, didn't feel good. When I get up there, it just was just as smooth as it could be. Amazing, isn't it? Amen. The Lord says that if we, we believe and we have faith, we just step out in obedience and he'll take care of the rest. I remember uh, when my mom died. Uh, she was the hub of our family and uh, that was really tough. And then same time, I had a deacon and uh, his wife was killed in an automobile accident. And so... Uh, I'd just been to the funeral home with Ann, got home, find out my mom died. And so I went home that, and I had 
I had the deacon's wife's funeral on a Friday morning and my mom's funeral on a Friday afternoon. And uh, I, I remember uh, when it was time for my mom's funeral, it was only the grace of God, but there is a surge of strength. Amen. When you yield and you believe and you just step out by faith, you begin to experience that working power in your life to be able to do what you could not do on your own. Amen? Uh, you don't know how many times before I come in to preach, like uh, he said, scared to death, I don't feel like I'm ready, I don't know about the message and everything like that, and you get in it, and God carries you through. And he does that every day of our life, by the way. Okay? And so, uh, just enjoy it. Uh, number nine, give an example in your life how Romans 8, 26 is when you pray. Give an example. How does that work? Let me spread the news around here a little bit. But Somebody else raise your hand up now. Okay, let me say this to you. Okay? I wrote this down. I'll go in prayer asking God for a lot. <laughs> but as I'm in God's presence, the Spirit helps me to see better what's important, what agrees with God's Word. Understanding God is so much greater, wiser than myself, all of a sudden I begin to yield and surrender to whatever God wants. And before I leave that prayer, I say, Thy will be done. It, that's, I mean, that's just... Sometimes uh, you go and pray, you don't know what to say, do you? You don't know how to handle that. And the Spirit of God takes that, okay? Uh, the things I wanted to happen all of a sudden begin to grow strangely dim. <laughs> huh? And uh, the Spirit worked in my heart to leave my wants and begin to desire whatever God's will, God's plan for my life was more than what I even wanted. Uh, isn't that how it works? I wrote this down. The highest expression of faith is trust. Give God our request, then trust his will about it. Huh? But then we're criticized for saying, thy will be done. When we should be credited, we understand it. We're more matured because we understand that God's will is so much better than our own will. Amen. Amen. And so the person that says that ought to give, get credit for that and not be criti criticized for that. Amen. Because, I mean, I've heard him on TV say, all oh, this thy will be done stuff. You know, no, I think it's a humble surrender to the perfect will of God. And I'm going to trust it. Here's my situation, what's going on. However you want to handle it, God, I'm trusting you. Amen? Amen. Okay. Philippians 2.13 is so true when you pray. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Isn't that true? That he's working in you to bring you to the point that we should have been in before we ever started our prayers. <laughs> Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. God, give me this. God, give me that. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I've been kind of selfish, haven't I? Let me back up a little bit. Then you start working through it. <laughs> okay? Uh, explain, number 10, explain why it is impossible today to commit the unpardonable sin and why do some churches preach that it is for today? Why is it impossible to commit the unpardonable sin? How many of you ever heard about the unpardonable sin, okay? Have you ever heard somebody say, I've committed the unpardonable sin, I think. Hey, I've talked with people like that, and they're scared to death. Uh, they uh, are fearful. I've seen them cry. I just think I've committed the unpardonable sin, you know. And uh, what's the, why can we not commit it today? Carol? Well, Christ had to be present on the earth at that time. And Mary Paul's sign, they attributed that to the devil rather than the Holy Spirit. 
they can, can, can yes, right. Okay, now, uh, what text is uh, the unpardonable sin in? Matthew, the gospel, okay. So when I read Matthew, automatically I, I know where I am in context, don't I? Who's he dealing with? Jews, the religious ones, and he's offering himself that he's the Messiah. A Messiah performs miracles according to prophecy. He was performing miracles. And what did the religious leaders do? They rejected him. They rejected that and said that he was performing those miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit or by the power of Satan. It is a dispensational sin. It cannot be committed today. God can forgive any sin today, people. Amen? But this was a dispensational sin to the people of Israel. And by the way, uh, if Christ had not had sa have said, Father, forgive them, they never would have had an opportunity over in here in Acts to be able to receive the kingdom. Do you know that? But because it was the prayer of the Son, the Father forgave him. Okay? But we cannot commit that sin today. Also, uh, I wrote this down. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit within context, its dispensation, cannot be committed today because the Holy Spirit is not present. Christ is not present the Spirit of God is not presenting him as the Messiah nor the Jewish prophetic kingdom program to Israel. That's not being done today. That was a dispensational sin. And when you rightly divide the word, it's in Matthew 12, he's dealing with Israel. It's about the gospel of the kingdom. I don't worry about that. Huh? So if somebody says you can commit the unpardonable sin just because you take your Bible and you say, I don't believe tongues are for today. You're saying you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit because he's the one who performs the tongues. That's not true. Hello? Did you understand what I just said? Or that person's not of God. What they're doing, those, those miracles and stuff, like, you know, or whatever. You blaspheme against Holy Spirit. Shouldn't do that. And so I said, you don't even know what blaspheme of the Holy Spirit is because it was committed back here during Christ's earthly ministry when he was presenting himself as Messiah. Okay? Okay, let me see here. Well, I'll just skip that. Okay, anybody else want to make comment about Holy Spirit? We'll get in the devil real fast here. Yes, sir. Amen. Isn't that good? That's good. I like that. Okay, lesson eight. I'm going to move on this pretty fast. Go to the questions. Go to the questions. Number one, why didn't Paul allow Satan's reality to remain hidden? Is that a problem? If so, why? Why didn't Paul do that? Yes, sir. Exactly. If you don't know there's an enemy, you're already vulnerable, right? And so Paul didn't want that to happen. I wrote this, ignorance of Satan has led too many to be defeated by him and catching them off guard. Being alert helps us to be ready, to be vigilant, be prepared, and not an easy target or to be blindsided, okay? Now, how does the world view the existence of Satan? Huh? He doesn't exist, does he? It's just crazy religious stuff. Amen? Well, it doesn't get by, so it's just a joke with them, okay? I, I remember the story of Luther. Uh, Luther. Uh, he was battling the, uh, the, the devil and he, he said it was as if his shadow was on the wall where he was, and he threw his inkwell at it. And the inkwell hit and burst on the wall, 
And they said that ink is still there on that wall where he had that battle with Satan. <laughs> uh, if we would be honest, all of us have had battles, and perhaps not with Satan specifically, but with his demonic forces, right? And uh, they are real. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It states in Ephesians 6, 12, you know it well, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, so uh, let me just say to you, Satan is real. So you need to be on guard. So you don't allow yourself, neither give place to the devil. To allow him a window or a door or a crack because they want to come in. Number two, what area does Satan try to attack in our lives and why? Satan tries to get us to disbelieve God's word. I mean, he hates that. And uh, he doesn't want us to believe what God has said and that help causes us to be disobedient. And in the process, if I don't believe what God is saying, that will hinder my growth in my relationship with Christ, won't it? Okay? It'll really hinder my growth there. Uh, but I really believe that one of the great areas uh, is our thought life. Uh, he attacks us to make us get full of pride, amen, and uh, he works in our mind, we begin to think wrong, that leads us to do what's wrong. You might be in church, the Spirit of God might be moving, and you're really being blessed or whatever, somebody might be singing this song, has got a great message to it, and you're just blessed, and all of a sudden, you just happen to catch uh, men, you just happen to catch a young lady over here, and uh, she goes by, and all of a sudden, a bad thought comes just like that. You'll, <laughs> huh? Be honest with me now, okay? It's amazing how the devil really works on our minds, doesn't he? And uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 was one of the verses I gave you in your study. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what we have to work on, isn't it? To be able to do that. Uh, number three, what truth does Satan especially hate and attack? Okay, he hates sound doctrine and especially... The mystery program, okay? He hates this program right here with a passion. Why? Exactly, and it's, it's that gospel that defeated Satan, okay? He hates that message. It took him in his own craftiness, didn't it, okay? And uh, he just, he hates it. Uh, he hates our gospel of grace. Uh, and what the gospel of grace guarantees us, and he can't stop that. Huh? We're going to heaven if you've been saved. Amen? <laughs> he hates that. He can't stop that. He wants to take us to hell with him. Huh? <laughs> yes, Richard. And that's something? Very good point. Yeah. Amen. That's good. I like that. And by the way, I wrote this down. Also, he hates the church where we fellowship with others of faith because that's so encouraging to us. And Satan tries to prevent our own faithfulness, doesn't he? Uh, you know, when you come to church and you're around your friends and things like that, it's a shot in the arm. 
It's a real encouragement. And he wants to prevent that encouragement. So we'll get down, despair, discouraged, depressed, all those things. And uh, that's why he doesn't want you to be faithful. And by the way, since beginning to hear about the mystery program, what have you noticed about Satan? Since you begin to understand rightly dividing the scriptures, okay, what have you begin to understand about Satan? Anybody? Let me see a hand. Anybody? Yes, Melvin? He's an imposter. He's an imposter. That's true. He's got angels of light that are imposters. Joyce? Huh? No, we're in good shape, but the devil? He works harder on us. He sure does. Since trying to present this, we have received more attacks than ever before. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Number four, if Satan is Satan involved in signs and wonders today? Okay. How is he involved today? Yes, Val? False teachers, false doctrine. Okay. Yes. Amen. That's good. And uh, he has uh, uh, false miracles. You, you know, he, like Antichrist, he'll come with lying wonders. Okay? And uh, just because you see somebody who supposedly, who has an experience in a miracle, does not mean it's of God. Okay? You have to always remember that. I always say, what do they teach about salvation, about life? And on and on it goes, yes, sir. So what do you say about that? He said that they were praying and their rosary turned to gold. Huh? He saw the gold. What do you say about that? Could Satan do something like that? Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fool's gold. That's good. I like that. Okay. Okay. I wrote this down. Why are people so easily... De and by the way, let me just say, we believe that God heals if it's his will. Uh, we've had a number of people. God's touched them and raised them up. We praise God for that, okay? So I, I didn't want you to think we don't believe that. Uh, I put that, why are people so easily deceived with this? They don't know the word. That's right. Exactly right. And do you know that, uh, is it possible that Satan could do something just to draw me in a little bit more into his deception? Huh? Well, of course he could. If you remember when Moses had his snake, what did Jambres and, and what's called do? Uh, Pharaoh's magicians, they threw their rods down. What happened? They're, they became snakes. Okay? See what I'm saying? So... Satan can perform certain things, that's for sure. Don? I found that uh, many times Satan's messengers are much more prepared than we are sometimes. They, they seem to be more knowledgeable about what they believe and what we believe. And if we aren't real careful, they can uh, make you believe a black sheep's a white one. That's right. And that's an indictment against Christians today that we just don't study. We don't read. We don't study. We don't dig. We don't know why we believe what we believe. 
but we're trying to change that, right? Now, let me go fast here, okay? Number five, why is Satan so successful through accusations? Why is he so successful to get people to uh, criticize and accuse other people? Doubt, fear. Doubt, fear. Huh? He controls us. He controls us. Linda? He makes us feel like we're unworthy. Because we like to hear trash about other people and share it with other people. Amen? That's who we are. Unless the Spirit of God's controlling us. Ah! Amen? <laughs> okay? I put, he works in believers to get them to accuse each other, causing hurt and unforgiveness. His greatest accusation is when a believer fails and he accuses them, they're unworthy. God doesn't love you any longer. There's no hope and he keeps you down. What's the use? Amen? Huh? So I wrote this down. Why do people want to believe garbage about other people? Connie? Yeah, you lift yourself up over them, don't you? You're a little bit better than them when you take them down a little bit, right? Okay, I'm going to skip those next verses, Kelly. Number six, is there any way we can defeat Satan's attacks against us? Yes, the best way is for us to become strong through Bible study, knowledge, prayer, then application of God's truth, obedience, faith in what God says in his word. By doing this, we are arming our mind, our heart, so we can stand when Satan attacks us. And by the way, that's the only way you'll ever stand. You just keep putting the word of God in you and relationship with God and growing and staying strong and trusting what God says. And when Satan comes, you won't fall prey to his tricks. Uh, James 4, 7 says this here. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. But the preceding verse says this here. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. It's not it. Well, I've got authority. I'm going to take care of the devil. Devil, you... Hmm. Do you know he held... Gabriel up for quite a few what weeks in answering a prayer of Daniel's and, uh, and one of Satan's men hindered him so you can imagine what Satan could do. A lot of people said, ah, I'll just step on him. I think that person's stupid. You know what I mean? Uh, you better go in the humility of God, not the fear but humility that you're totally dependent upon God and God Almighty for his strength to be able to help you to withstand. Okay? Uh, I wrote down here, give an example of a satanic attack and what did you do? Uh, I remember one time uh, my brother-in-law gave me a knife from Cambodia. And if you study anything about demons and stuff, uh, these are figures and stuff and they are objects that demons possess at times. And uh, I remember uh, it was the middle of the night. I woke up. It's the middle of the night. And I just looked over at that knife, and it was evil. I cannot explain it. I got up, threw some clothes on real fast, went over and picked up that. It was a machete. Picked up that big knife, got in my car, took it out to the interstate, and all the way there, I'm singing nothing but the blood of Jesus. <laughs> That's the truth. And I threw that thing away. And as soon as I threw it away, I got back in my car and go, the peace of God was all over me. It's amazing. I remember I was down in Green Pond, Alabama. There's a real place there. My friend Charlie Chapman. And they had been having problems with some uh, demonic attacks down there. And that night, I'm not kidding you, it was a warfare. I stayed up all night. I prayed. I read the word. I trusted God. And that morning when the sun came up is when it broke through and there was peace of God. Uh, you have encounters with evilness from time to time. 
It's not to be afraid, but you persevere through the word, through prayer, for trusting God. You put on the armor of God, do you not? Amen? Okay, let me see here. Number seven, why is choice so important to the believer? It's because we have the ability not to give any place in our life by choosing not to sin. We're not helpless. We have a will. We can choose to do right or wrong. Satan cannot make us do anything if we choose not to do it. Amen? Uh, I'm going to skip that next verse there. Number eight, our weakest point is our mind. And uh, I believe one of the reasons the mind, the, the weakest point is our mind is because it's connected to our flesh. And they work together. And we allow Satan to put thoughts uh, that appeal to my flesh. And that's very hard to say no to sometime, okay? So is it possible then for me to strengthen myself, my mind? Philippians 4, 8, you know it well. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, okay? Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, okay? We grow our minds in the knowledge of Christ and that arms us, does it not? Amen? Number nine, why is God's word, truth, a weapon the believer can use? And I wrote down, because it answers every lie Satan throws at us to get us to sin. Every time Christ was tempted, what did he say? It is written. He quoted scripture back, did he not? Amen? And we fight back against Satan's lies with God's truth. Okay? The word of God shows us the truth. We believe then what God says, and we reject the devil's lies. Okay? And when you put on the armor of God, the only offensive weapon that there is is what? The sword, which is the word. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of center of soul and spirit. And so the word of God can get in places we don't even know how to get there, and it permeates us. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You are clean through the word. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. I mean this, thy word is truth. And the more I put that in my life and my heart and I believe it and I'm trying to apply it in a practical way in my life, when the devil's temptations come my way, I say, no way, Jose. Make sense? Number 10, what is your greatest defense against Satan and temptation and why? What is the greatest defense we have? The whole armor of God. That's our greatest defense. And the armor of God are, it's a spiritual, there's, it's a spiritual garment. Amen? That we place upon our life. Putting on that blocks the fiery darts of the devil that he shoots at us. Okay? Uh, let me see here. Here's what I put down. It's God's spiritual armor, our daily practice, reading God's truth, knowing God's truth, beginning to try to live God's truth, stand in faith, never forget what Christ has done for us, God's, having God's presence in my daily life and bathed in prayer, and then we can stand up and not only have victory in our life, but we can stand up and defend God's name and the truth about God. Ephesians 6, 13 says this, Wherefore, uh, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Amen? So, here I am. 
I'm a child of God now, and I've got God's Word. I systematically begin to read. I begin to study. I, when I realize what that truth is, I begin to try to apply that truth to my life, to my walk, to my lifestyle, to my habits. And as I'm doing that, I continue to read and learn more. I'm putting off the old man, the old habits. I'm putting on the new man, the new habits, the new lifestyle, and I just keep going and going. And all of a sudden, I begin to realize I'm yielding my members, I'm yielding my life to righteousness. And Romans 6.13 says in 6.11 that make no provision for the flesh. We're to walk in righteousness, aren't we? And the more I'm doing that, I tell you, when the attacks come, what will you do? You're prepared, you're ready, and you won't fall. Amen? Hey, I've said this a million times in 30 plus years. It's not deep. <laughs> huh? It's not deep. Get in the Word, study it. Okay, Kenny, uh, fellow.